we can spend quite a lot of time uh, thinking and discussing and speculating about potential weaknesses in the transatlantic or coalition response, if I can call it that, if we're, we are calling that that. I mean, there are obvious individual countries uh, which are not really lined up with the, uh, with the major thrust um, of, the, of the coalition response and of the NATO response. In practice, uh, that is not, that has not um, impeded uh, the solidity, solidarity, and persistence uh, of the response, uh, as I said, from the coalition uh, broadly defined and, uh, and NATO. So I am thinking as of now, as of today, that that still remains uh, really remarkably solid considering the amount of time um, and the issues that are, that are at stake. So on that one. And on sanctions, well, that's turned out to be more complicated than many people thought. The sheer scale and rapidity of the sanctions imposed on the Russian economy, <clears throat> uh, which has over so many years, until recently anyway, um, been increasingly integrated. And I've watched this happen uh, very close at hand over many years. Um, and then to see all those connections and contacts and networks and so on, you know, broken more or less overnight. Uh, and the people leaving and the investors leaving and the employers and the companies leaving and the, the skills and so on, all suddenly leaving just like that, really remark remarkable. Um, and so one was bound to think at the moment, well, some kind of crash is, is going to come, you know, very shortly within the Russian economy. In practice, that hasn't happened. Um, in, in practice, uh, the, the Russian economy has turned out to be you know, quite resilient. This has provided material uh, to uh, the government and the Kremlin, um, uh, President Putin and so on, uh, really to present a picture of, a, of, of an economy which can bounce back uh, pretty quickly from the, uh, from the pressure from outside. Um, and is proving uh, much more resilient um, than had been expected, and so on. And all those debates, and of course, there's a lot of pushback of that kind, which is sort of sometimes propaganda, but sometimes clearly believed. Uh, I see no sign of negotiations, uh, and I haven't seen them uh, for several months now. Uh, I mean, in the first couple of months, you know, one could imagine uh, an extremist something. Uh, something happening, but I, don't, I do not see it now. That's the, the, the first point. So making, answering the question about what does victory look like is, is, is difficult, or well, putting mildly difficult, because really one is still at the extreme ends for both cases. So anything short, really, of the expulsion of Russian occupation from uh, Ukrainian territory, which wasn't occupied at least before the 24th of February, on the one hand, um, that you know is going to be pretty hard for Zelensky and Kiev, Kiev to um, to accept and to be seen to accept. In fact, at the moment, I can't quite imagine it. Uh, equally, and all, there's a lot of talk about uh, it being possible for President Putin uh, to present liberation of the Donbass um, as a victory. Uh, there are two points there, of course, and the first is that he's some way off the liberation, even of the Donbass. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's an interesting subject to discuss. And, um, and, and secondly, it was absolutely obvious that the original um, objectives for the uh, special military operation were much more ambitious than uh, the Donbass and almost certainly remain much more ambitious. Uh, and there'll be a, a very widespread understanding of that. So for even in a society which is used to accepting and being seen to accept the line from the government, it will be difficult uh, for that to really be convincing uh, for the population because, of course, as, as you know very well, uh, on the one hand, people accept you know, what the government says. On the other hand, they're cynical about it and never completely accept it you know, within themselves. And that's a natural consequence of that kind of society.